At a time when the political and cultural narratives of the world were at each other's throats, one thinker emerged onto the scene and challenged those narratives by seeking to understand their very foundations. This man wanted nothing more than to liberate people from crimes that go unspoken and unnoticed within the status quo so that those very people could have the chance to be what they actually are. This man's name was Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault was a French philosopher, historian, and public intellectual who is remembered for his method of using historical research to illuminate changes in discourse over time. Foucault's work inspired sociologists in subfields including sociology of knowledge, gender, sexuality, critical theory, deviance and crime, and so many more. His well-known works include Discipline and Punish, The History of Sexuality, and The Archaeology of Knowledge. Foucault was born to an upper-middle-class family in France in 1926. His father was a surgeon and his mother the daughter of a surgeon. Foucault attended one of the most competitive and demanding high schools in Paris. He recounted later a troubled relationship with his father, who bullied him for being delinquent. In 1948, he attempted suicide for the first time and was placed in a psychiatric hospital. Both of these experiences seemed tied to his homosexuality, as his psychiatrist believed that his suicide attempt was motivated by his marginalized status in society. Like many other great thinkers, Foucault would be both deeply affected and motivated by his experiences. The chaotic sight of such an experience would be the wound from which Foucault would launch one of the most influential bodies of work of the 20th century. Following high school, Foucault was admitted to an elite secondary school in Paris, founded to train and create French intellectual, political, and scientific leaders. He read a wide range of philosophy, as is required in the rigorous French intellectual atmosphere, becoming versed in Hegel, Husserl, Marx, and so many others. For the next several years, he taught university courses in psychology while studying the works of many psychology philosophers like Jaspers and Freud, and he studied relationships between doctors and patients at the very hospital where he had been a patient for his suicide attempt in 1948. During this time, Foucault also read widely outside of psychology, like the works of Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Kafka, and many others. Foucault completed his thesis titled Madness and Insanity, History of Madness in the Classical Age in 1961. This, along with his next two books, The Birth of the Clinic and the Order of Things, showcase his historiographical method known as archaeology, which he used in his later books. Foucault's archaeology seeks to change the way we talk about a body of knowledge where we might typically speak of political, clinical, or cultural categories in a manner that refers to the deeper, more abstract meaning associated with them, he wants us to stay focused on how the actual conversations around such categories have played out. For Foucault, these discourses have an emergence in history and are influenced by a number of factors, none of which being a potent justificatory force behind the idea, but simply the efforts of people to force the idea into a place of domination. As such, when we study a particular discourse, we should examine how it has unfolded over time, the individuals and institutions at play, and other factors firmly attached to the idea itself. For him, there is no tracing back knowledge to some meaning outside of itself, and to invoke this as justification for an idea creates the very problems he was trying to unravel. Francis Bacon said that knowledge is power, but Foucault radicalizes this concept. Knowledge is not merely something that allows one to exercise a greater degree of control or political power but its very function is as a mode of force in the world. We don't just learn anything. We develop the means of acting in the world on the grounds of a body of knowledge we have worked on, and this will always come to direct the lives of people it claims to understand based on its own categories. Take the madman, for example. Foucault homes in on how treatment of the mentally ill has changed in Europe as it transitioned into the modern era. While for millennia they had been treated as different, but not condemnable or distinct from society at large, the knowledge developed in the sciences came to categorize them in terms of this or that particular illness. This didn't just grant understanding. It caused the separation of all such people from society and dictated the course of their lives forever. Many would spend their lives in cramped clinics where they would be studied and isolated. The knowledge of these scientists was by no means complete and infallible, but it was widely accepted as justification for controlling the lives of thousands of people. Don't you see that knowledge is not just a means to power, but it is one in the same? Foucault also demonstrated in his work that the creation of subject and object categories is premised on hierarchies of power among people, and in turn, hierarchies of knowledge, whereby the knowledge of the powerful is considered legitimate and that of the less power is considered invalid. Importantly though, he emphasized that power is not held by individuals, but that it courses through society, lives in institutions, and is accessible to those who control institutions and the creation of knowledge, and thus considered knowledge and power inseparable and denoted them as one concept. 
At the root of Foucault's understanding of power are many influences, but one of the most powerful is Friedrich Nietzsche's conception of the will to power and his view of history through the method of genealogy. The idea that power is everywhere and always calls into question the authority of political institutions. Metaphysics is a branch of philosophy associated with identifying first principles to explain our reality, and this has historically taken the form of otherworldly conceptions, such as God. Nietzsche sought to overturn this way of doing things, and Foucault picks up this project for his own purposes. History is commonly thought of as a clashing of ideas, often depicted as being on opposite sides of good and evil. We have been told that the ideas that are still around today are there for a reason, but are they? One thing that Foucault picks out of Nietzsche's work is how going through history actually exposes the embarrassing and ironic origins of some of our grandest ideas. Origin stories like Constantine's victory through embracing Christianity and Spartan warriors being depicted as hyper-masculine all rely on an artificial narrative. Constantine's arch built in Rome to commemorate his victory shows no signs of a Christian cross painted on the shields and even depicts all of the classic Roman gods. The warriors of ancient Sparta and most of Greek males of the time, for that matter, engaged in regular homosexual behavior as part of their normal lives. These are not narratives told. They are not part of the history, but they are true. So what is truth? For Foucault, truth is just the force that won out. Instead of thinking of these great moments in history as a battle of ideas, we need to focus on the actual people who were involved, their motivations, and what resulted. The losers amount to nothing more or less than subjugated knowledges not evil or destined to have lost. When we assume that history has been moved by grand ideas, we see ourselves as fated to take up a role that history has bestowed upon us. This blocks us off from actually being able to see the world for what it is and limits our creativity. We essentially ignore the diversity of the past in favor of one assumed identity, and this has contributed to so many of the horrific problems of the 20th century. The crystallized truths and their subsequent productions block the creative capacities of the individual. By revealing the fictitious nature of the dominant narrative, genealogy can empower the individual to make sense of moments, instead of a procession of events held together by a central moral imperative that, while serving as a handrail, subjects us to someone else's story. Proper historical sense unlocks the immense creative range at our fingertips. Foucault examined the codes and concepts by which societies operate and define themselves, especially the principles of exclusion, such as the distinctions between sane or insane, gay and straight. By studying these social attitudes in relation to institutions, such as asylums, hospitals, and prisons, he theorized that one could trace the development of power. Thus, there was no one history, only the recorded history of supremacy. Foucault tragically died of complications from HIV in 1984. He stayed true to his roots and avoided building a philosophical system that could come to restrict anyone's thought in the future, even once remarking, I'm no prophet. My job is making windows where there were once walls. Having lived through the war, he would, of course, have his sights set on what caused such a violent event to occur, remarking that, the strategic adversary is fascism, he said. The fascism in us all, in our heads and in everyday behavior. The fascism that causes us to love power to desire the very thing that dominates and exploits us. Foucault was a thinker in the most active sense and saw his work as a way to finally break the cycle of breaking chains just to reforge chains for ourselves through some new ideology. He said, the real political task in a society such as ours is to criticize the workings of institutions that appear to be both neutral and independent, to criticize and attack them in such a manner that the political violence that has always exercised itself obscurely through them will be unmasked so that one can fight against them. Foucault argued that unless we took on these critical undertakings, we would remain in the wake of someone else's power, namely institutions which possess the knowledge that is used to write laws, classify mental illnesses, and assign cultural norms. When pressured by the media or other intellectuals to entrench himself in a particular place or divine himself by some label, he consistently resisted. Many remarked that every mask you removed had another underneath it, and it would always appear that Foucault really sought to live his philosophy, not just write it. He embraced the faded tragedy of life and threw himself into it, creating a unique legacy through pursuing what was important to him, which is something that all of us could learn to do a little bit more of. If you knew when you began a book what you would say at the end, do you think that you would have the courage to write it? What is true for writing and for love is true also for life. The game is worthwhile insofar as we don't know where it will end. This video marks the beginning of a series we will be doing on the greatest 20th century philosophers and thinkers in order to better position us to talk about problems in the modern day. If you have someone from the 20th century that you really want us to cover, please be sure to let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel for more. It helps us immensely.
visit the link in the comments to see how you can become a member of our community and support the channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.